Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Stop Chasing the Version, Compliance with NERC SIP V5 through SIP V99. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator here at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this presentation today. So before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge it. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console, and it covers most common technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. Due to the length of today's presentation, however, we won't do a live Q&A in the end, but our presenters can follow up with you later. And lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Also, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. Now let's get on with the presentation. I'd first like to introduce our three presenters today. Sid Schaefer from ICF, Trey Kirkpatrick from AssureX, and Jason Eiler from Tripwire. If you'd like to see their full bios, you can click on the bio widget at the bottom of your screen. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Kate. The cyber threat landscape is only becoming more challenging, and reliable delivery of energy is what's at risk. As you will see, our three companies have worked independently to assist the energy sector for years in a range of capacities. Through the NERC Alliance Network, we've seen how working together will bring higher value to all of your efforts preparing for SIP compliance, and hope by the end you'll be intrigued to know more. Let's go over today's agenda. It's important to note specifics about what we know today. That's well, where we'll start. Then we'll get some practical guidance on helping you develop sustainable, continuous compliance, not just a point-in-time snapshot. And last, we'll share useful highlights from tools and controls that have proven to save our clients many months. Now I'm going to hand it over to Sid Schaefer. Take it away, Sid. Thanks, Kate. I would also like to thank those attending for taking time to join us today. I know everybody's busy. We're going to cover a lot of ground in a really short amount of time, so <clears throat> understandably this is going to be at a little bit higher level. There's absolutely a deeper level of information involved that we're ready and willing to share, but won't have time to go into during this webinar. We could spend a whole day just on SIP2 alone. We're, however, we're going to be doing a <clears throat> going into that greater detail for free as part of a day and a half workshop that ICF, Tripwire, and AssureX are hosting here in Houston towards the end of March with significantly more detail. We'll walk through the SIP standards, and we'll have speakers that were formerly with the FBI, <coughs> or currently with the FBI and formerly with the NSA. We'll provide more information on that later. You may hear us refer to that workshop during this webinar. Also, there's a risk that you may have seen some of this information before. Uh, not all of these concepts are new, but our hope is that we're presenting these concepts at the very least in a way that you've not envisioned before and can help you start to think a little bit differently about your compliance approach. So, as Kate mentioned, my name is Sid Schaefer, and I'm the Energy Sector Lead for ICF's Commercial Cybersecurity and Compliance Group. Some information about ICF is on the slides. I'm not going to repeat all of that. But I've been working with companies on cybersecurity issues for more than 18 years, and I've been working with companies on NERC compliance efforts since 2007. In that time, I've seen a lot of changes, and those changes continue. For instance, here you see a graphic <clears throat> of kind of the upcoming changes in the SIP landscape. As we know, the main body of cyber regulations pertaining to electric are the NERC Critical Infrastructure Protection Standards, or SIP, for those of you that are not familiar with the, the acronym. While we currently live in version three of the SIP world, this is an overview of everything that's upcoming, and it's a mess. As you can see, version five, approved in November of 2013, largely set to go into effect April 1st of 2016. But some version five standards have already been supplanted by proposed changes in the form of six, or version, even version seven, which, just to make things more confusing, is likely to go back to being version six again once FERC actually formally approves it. 
So what are some key changes? There's a lot of similarities between current, <coughs> current version of SIP, version 3, and versions 5, 6, 7. NERC even has a handy chart that you can find that show how the current requirements are mostly compatible, quote unquote, with the new standards. But there's differences, and we'll talk very quickly about some of those differences. A lot of the changes in V5 deal with things like additional terms, BES cyber systems, reorganizing the standards by using tables instead of sub-requirements, changing the way the requirements are grouped, like moving vulnerability assessments out of SIP 5 and 7, and placing them in a brand new SIP 10. The main difference, and obviously the most challenging, deals with the way entities are now directed to identify, classify, and group their cyber assets as part of the new process <clears throat> that was once the RBAM in SIP version 2. Now we're using mandated criteria to assign high, medium, and low classifications to the, <clears throat> to the cyber assets. Indeed, out of 23 lessons learned and facts addressed by NERC, almost half dealt with the new version of SIP 2. Then we have pending changes in 6 and 7, or version 3, depending on which standard we're talking about. There's some more additional terms to know, like LERC and LEAP, Low Impact BES Cyber System Electronic Access Point. Some additional clarifications, guidance, requirements, revisions, some new requirements around transient devices and removable media, and some kind of new requirements like physical protection of cabling in SIP 6, which is honestly something that was dealt with in version 3. And all of this is going on under the auspices of the way that the regulators, a change in the way the regulators are actually looking at entities in the form of RAI and the risk-based approach. But wait. There's more. Beyond version 6 and 7, there's still uncertainty with formally approved standards. Things like virtualization and virtual servers, they still don't have clarity around how they're going to get protected. And there's uncertainty about how the current and future SIP standards should be aligned with things like the NIST cybersecurity framework called for by the executive order, which is coincidentally about to celebrate its first birthday or how companies can effectively utilize tools like ESC2M2 for SIP compliance. And we should have a better indication than most since ICF helped develop ESC2, ESC2M2 with the DOE in the first place. Or the part the voluntary, in quotes, DHSC cubed program will play. We don't necessarily believe that the program will be voluntary forever. And we find that with increased awareness of an issue generally comes increased likelihood of change to address the issue with things like the Sony hack showing nation state willingness for people to act badly and increased news about vulnerabilities of the grid, it doesn't take a huge leap to see there's a better than average chance of additional changes to SIP and additional regulations around critical infrastructure assets. So what we have here is a picture showing a commonly seen compliance program. Each one of the companies on this webinar we're sponsoring this webinar, and you know, we kind of all talked as we developed this. And we each had similar share stories to share regarding this image. We've all seen this occur at, well, <clears throat> let's just say more companies than would be ideal, where an entity develops policies and procedure and staffs up for a big compliance push, generates evidence for audit, only to change its focus soon afterward and then kind of pivot back and do it all over again for an upcoming self-cert or another, an additional divisions compliance efforts. Sometimes they don't even realize how much additional risk has been generated until they pivot back. And everyone seems to agree that it's better and easier on a company in the long run to move to a more consistent model of compliance similar to this slide. This is where you have a constant state of compliance. The question we're here to discuss today is how, especially in light of all the changes that we just talked about, in the current, upcoming, and unknown worlds, how we get to this place. Well, the changing requirements mean that there's some likelihood of at least changing some component of your compliance program. We see companies achieve this largely in one of three main ways. And I'd like to use the analogy of a person on a dock kind of beside a lake. The first the letter of the law approach would be the person grabbing on the dock rail and hanging on with all they've got, clinging to the way things used to be. We've heard a number of companies ask us, can't we just stick with the way things were? Can't we just check the box and, and move on? And this, this letter of the law approach 
you know, it's a siloed approach. Division's kind of doing their own th thing, checking the box, and, and largely dealing with the regulators on a case-by-case -case basis. And the answer to the question of can we stay with the way things were is, is no. But you can approach it the same way, which is not something we would recommend. The second one would be the person on the dock that's kind of dipping their toe in the water. They've heard about this fun new controls-based thing. They've heard the terms RAI and risk-based approach, and they've kind of read the CMEP documentation and the transition guidance, and they really want to, to learn more about it, but their focus is specific on to the immediacy of compliance risks and the risks associated with non-compliance, nothing more. The final would be taking a more holistic approach, swimming fluidly from point A to point B, that's the person in the lake, using a more holistic approach. We recommend the latter. So there it is, that's kind of the, the big takeaway. If you want to comply with SIP today or tomorrow, it's about addressing your cyber risk at a more comprehensive level using a comprehensive appro approach. Excuse me. And the best time really is to start now. So what are the components of this holistic approach that we kind of talk about at, at an academic level? First is compliance. You got it. Nobody's suggesting that you can't pay attention to the nuances of your of what you're <clears throat> regulated to comply with. Everything kind of starts here. There's going to be four particular mindsets overall, and this is one. And you can call them lenses or perspectives or components. But you need to know what's relevant for your organization to comply with and pay attention to some of those specifics. Compliance represents the base level of cybersecurity, not necessarily the ideal. Some even argue that compliance doesn't even cover the base. The second component to consider is, or lens to look through, is the cyber lens. Beyond the scope of specific compliance, you should consider the cyber risks to your organization as a whole, to the whole landscape. Look at the environment for cyber risks, not just for compliance, but for the reliable delivery of energy, for operational success, and address for financial risks. You can gain economies of scale improvements by leveraging cybersecurity across the whole organization. The third component to consider as part of your holistic approach are the controls themselves. You should have a robust understanding of what controls are in place to address the risks that have been identified in the prior areas, which controls are really important, which ones are key controls, and which one are just controls that are there uh, to mitigate others perhaps who owns the controls, and how one control might mitigate multiple risks. So mapping those controls to the risk. And the final component, one that doesn't come up quite as often, is resiliency. Because controls will break down somewhere. We're all likely to have an incident, however small. Because we're all under attack, the attack's constant, it's not going away. We need to have an understanding as an organization how we react and how we continue to operate in the face of an incident. I should note here that resiliency is often tied to kind of the corrective component of the controlled environment. These things are not discrete. There's definitely an interdependent relationship there. But our overall strategy should include this consideration of redundancy, or resiliency rather, whether it's by redundancy, even though that's not part of SIP, or by other means. It should be part of the fabric of the program. So what are some of what are some advantages of taking this holistic approach? I have two young kids. They love stories. Auditors, they're not any different. They love a good story. They tend to prefer nonfiction. Compliance is, after all, a story about how you as an organization approach a particular requirement or address a particular risk. By incorporating all four aspects of our proposed strategy, you're able to tell a much more compelling story than just a specific action you take because the regulatory body told you you should take it. It allows you to show how you're addressing risk from a number of different perspectives, how they all combine to reduce your overall cyber profile or cyber risk profile. This compelling story also extends itself to a much firmer support system that you can draw on as regulatory changes occur, meaning you don't have to retool your program every time an additional requirement pops up. And of course, it reduces risks across, across the whole organization, compliance risk, operational risk, financial risk, reputational risk, and more. 
It allows you to adopt a more proactive approach to dealing with its challenges. As a result, you're able to be more efficient. You're able to allocate resources more effectively. Rather than just jumping from one crisis to the next, you're able to forecast better where your resources are needed to go. And finally, it provides a closer alignment with the direction being taken by NERC and the regions with the RAI risk-based approach, which honestly ties back to the traditional audit approaches that you see elsewhere in other industries for things like Sarbanes-Oxley. And one major benefit of aligning more directly with the regulatory direction is that once they understand what the story is of your organization, they're very likely to reduce the scope of things they'll look at on a go-forward basis. Specifically, the holistic approach we recommend supports RAI. And I know that the terminology is changing a bit. I use RAI just because it's, it's easier. But the risk-based approach, or <clears throat> whatever term you would like to refer to it as, uh, I'm sure there's some colorful ones. Both are based on internal controls approaches. They both use a combination of preventative, detective, corrective controls, which I'm not going to go into here. There's a lot of presentations on what those are. We'll even go into some of that stuff <clears throat> in more detail as part of the workshop. But this, this ties directly to the ICE process, which is currently voluntary, and we feel beneficial. So the region is going to, as part of the RAI approach, is going to identify risks to your organization, and they're going to ask you what controls you have to mitigate those risks. How can you map those controls back to identified risks if you don't know what your controls are? So going through a controls rationalization process is going to be key towards making this whole effort easier. When properly applied, the approach naturally generates audit-ready evidence through the internal evaluation of your controls. And because of the more compelling compliance story, it greatly supports the zero-find paths of find-fix track or we're moving towards the compliance exception self-logging. So how do we implement this type of program? Well, to begin with, for a lot of companies, you have to prepare for change. For most, it's a change in perspective, a change in how the organization approaches compliance and cybersecurity. There's a big component of initial organizational change. Obtaining C-level and stakeholder leadership is critical. We can't go much in the way how to achieve this, and that's a, an issue in and of itself, just during this webinar. But, we'll, but we will, including guidance on how to bridge that IT-OT gap, again, as part of the workshop. We're just so limited on time. The second part is the cross-functional team, speaking of the ITOT gap. Surround your compliance project with a team of people from across the organization that can effectively help you define an accurate baseline and identify risk. And then the real kind of bedrock of the program is to determine a solid baseline. You can see the quote by Aristotle there, but it really is the beginning. Understanding your technology environment is absolutely critical. And think about all of the components, the hardware, the applications, the people, the traffic. If you don't understand what's normal, you cannot identify when something's changed, when there's been an event, or where your risks truly are. In almost every major incursion that we come across, the most effective forensic, involves, uh, forensic analysis, it involves comparing the compromised machine or environment to a gold image which is really, really difficult if you don't have an idea of what that gold image should be. Once you know yourself, you'll, need to anal you'll be able to effectively analyze the risks of the organization based on that baseline information, and you'll set your goals. This is your chance to define your gold image, your key controls, your vision for what objectives you want to achieve, and the areas of risk you most directly want to address. It allows you to begin to craft your story. Finally, it comes down to implementing the controls you identify and develop. These controls should support a program based on processes, not just listing things on paper. And there's a quote there by, by WEC that uh, has been held true in a lot of different regions. They don't like the regurgitation of the requirement as evidence of you having a control. So let's take a look at how these pers perspectives would be employed in the real world. First, we're going to have a more general example, and then we'll have one kind of specific to SIP. But because we're talking about cyber, there's certainly going to be a little bit of bleed. 
The first is a general area of risk that everyone has, critical data. In some form or fashion, everyone has data that needs to be secured. The first component to consider are any specific compliance obligations you may have with regards to critical data. For those in energy, it would likely involve SIP 11, or what was formerly known as SIP 3, R4. For healthcare, it's going to be HIPAA, DHS, and DOD have their own. So we're going to pay attention to the specific requirements there. Next, we want to take a look through the lens of the cybersecurity components related to securing that critical data across the organization, the impact of that data being compromised beyond the specific data required by the standard. And we want to look at the most salient risks for the organization overall, operational, financial, reputational compliance, and put appropriate controls in place to address the risks identified. We've had several clients employ the PBF method of securing data, or protected by firewall, meaning everybody behind the firewall could access the data. If you're in our network, we don't care. Even though the risks of the organization were not fully addressed by that, we help them put in place a data classification scheme, role-based credentialing program, which we would call a preventative control, an access alerting mechanism when invalid attempts were made on specific areas of the network as a detective control, and a service level agreement where outbound communication with certain locations was completely severed based on specific event types occurring. And what the SLA did was it helped everybody in the organization understand why data might not be accessible should a specific type of event occur. From a resiliency standpoint, as we've discussed, the corrective controls are often tied to resiliency. So the execution of the SLA and the subsequent investigation of the incident and restoration of service would comprise the resiliency component. Let's talk specifically about an example in the SIP world. We'll be going through all the new SIP standards in more detail during the workshop, but during our limited time, we're just going to discuss one discrete component, SIP 4 R4.1, or more accurately, uh, I guess you could say uh, part 4.1 for R4, but it doesn't quite translate as well for the slides. The first component would be compliance. First thing we need to consider is the compliance component a need-based authorization process for electronic access, physical access, and critical information. That's a paraphrase. So we need a process for specific asset types to gain access. We should consider that process for more than just the BCAs and the PCAs. We should consider the cyber risk as a whole for the organization and address the risk with appropriate controls, ideally a mix of preventative, detective, and corrective, to address the real risk. I've heard some of that some presentations have given that risk as being a lack of a program. I would argue that the real risk is inappropriate people gaining access to my cyber resources. So how do I address that risk? Well, one main control would be the preventative control of having a formal onboarding and offboarding process. Specific criteria outlined for who gets what kind of access. We've seen companies where operational technology or OT doesn't understand the need for formal onboarding or offboarding process, doesn't have the experience in necessarily reviewing access from a role-based or need-to-know perspective. Cases where those OT personnel use root privileges to perform their job. Well, and, it, and it's not just OT. We've seen cases where help desk personnel had domain admin privileges. Why? Because no matter what kind of call they got, they could help. A detective control would be a log review of unauthorized access attempts. And the corrective control would, would be the execution of access, revocation, and password change protocols. From a resiliency perspective, we would want to ask ourselves, as an organization, what happens when the unauthorized use is detected? We'd want to work towards ensuring the answer allowed us to operate effectively in the face of compromise, whether by employing the corrective control I just mentioned above or otherwise. Hopefully by now, we've made the case that the holistic approach is what will best allow you to adjust to changing conditions, how at least at a high level, a company would go about implementing a program like that. And we've given a couple of practical examples. So you're convinced 
or well, at least considering, a move towards this approach, which offers you a great opportunity to implement additional controls, to automate those controls, and utilize tools to manage and report compliance, monitor and automate responses. Tools that are similar to what our teaming partners offer, tools which ICF has seen successfully support this holistic approach, which is one reason we see such great synergy between ICF, Tripwire, and Assurex. Thank you, Sid, for that great overview. I would also like to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. I am Trey Kirkpatrick, Vice President of Energy and Utility Compliance Services with Assurex. I've worked in the utility and regulatory industry for over 23 years. Assurex is an industry leader in enterprise regulatory compliance software. Assurex, with decades of expertise built into our solutions, enables companies to exceed quality expectations, ensure compliance, manage risk, and better govern their enterprise. The Assurex Energy and Utilities Enterprise Management Solution includes automated best practice workflows, training tutorials for NERC compliance, both 693 and SIP, that unites and coordinates information, activities, and documentation for the registered entities. It's simple to deploy, configure, and modify. Our enterprise solution has pre-configured dashboards, metrics, alerts, and key performance indicators. We also have a professional services organization that works with our customers on their implementation. Today we will focus on how Assurex Enterprise Solutions supports the implementation of SIP version 5 standards and beyond. Our document management solution allows for the collaboration, reviews, and approvals of all SIP governing documents. It also maintains a complete audit history. Scheduling compliance activities. This is one of the most used workflows in our solution by our customers for 693 and SIP compliance. Many tasks need to be performed on a periodic basis. Our evidence schedules provide the means to autom for automating those tasks at the desired frequency. Email notifications are sent to the assignee. The electronic reviews and approvals are required before the tasks are completed. Our software can be integrated with solutions such as Tripwire's IP360, and Log Center that collects valuable compliance evidence. We are also finding customers using our software to implement their internal compliance controls. Our customers work with firms like ICF to develop these internal controls and enter into our enterprise solution. During our workshop in March, I am going to go into greater detail for our two SIP solutions. SIP system management is a full change management workflow for an entity's BES systems, cyber assets, and tracking all tasks and approvals. As Sid discussed earlier, as an example, SIP 004, access management can cause some major issues with the entities. Our access solution addresses the electronic approvals and maintains a complete audit trail. Access lists must be reviewed and documented. These reports are generated and maintained in our software. Also, developing a robust corrective action program is necessary for a strong compliance and risk-based organization. Our corrective action solution is a simple but comprehensive process. Here is a high-level overview of our SIP solution. The four objects on the right, the system, security perimeter, asset group, and cyber assets, represent our SIP system management. Cyber assets can belong to more than one system. We have configured a many-to-many -many relationship to allow this. The security perimeter represents both electronic and physical perimeters. System and asset owners are identified in the solution. 
and we have also configured the software to allow for asset groups, which, will, which are collections of cyber assets for the purpose of managing change. The two objects on the left of the slide are for the SIP access management solution. User records are managed for employees or non-employees, such as contractors and vendors, that need access or removal from a cyber system or asset. Access role provides the access levels for a group of individuals that need the same access rights. The SIP change task form allows an entity to manage the, chain requ the change request for a cyber asset. It can be an addition, a modification, or a removal of a cyber asset. In this example, on the left side is the existing state of the asset. And on the right side of the form is what needs to be modified. As you can see, it highlights what the changes are. This change request has a workflow for the required approvals and the change tasks that are created and assigned. A change task will have checklists. This checklist is very configurable based on the entity and their requirements. The entity can create a library of questions that can be specific to the type of asset. You can have a different list of questions for additions, modifications, and another set of questions for the removal of that asset. Like all of the Assurex forms, there is a complete audit trail for the life of that cyber asset. The SIP system management solution has a baseline form that allows an entity to maintain a record of the cyber asset baseline configuration and a complete audit history of software release dates and install dates. This form can be edited for tracking change management to the assets baseline. This form can be configured to specific entity requirements or if the evidence needs to be brought over from a solution like Tripwires, that can also happen. On this screen is an example of the access change request from our SIP access management solution. The access management forms have the personnel risk assessment, the SIP training dates for the individual, the system, will trigger notifications based on rules that those dates are coming due to the individual supervisor. The requester can identify what systems and access levels are needed for that individual or group. And there are filters on the form for narrowing down the searches. When the request is submitted, the system will automatically know if this individual or group needs to be granted access or access needs to be removed. The workflow will send out email notifications for access approvals. The system also has a revoke all access feature that will launch tasks and updates to the appropriate groups and individuals. We all know that there is not one solution that can meet all the SIP requirements. Many of our customers have Tripwire. I would now like Jason Eiler from Tripwire's Professional Services Division to discuss their NERC SIP solution suite. All right. Thanks, Trey. All right. So far, we've been covering some general principles for an effective security and compliance program, and we've seen an overview of a workflow management and process automation tool and seen how it can help enforce and help you prove compliance. Now we're going to take a look at the heart of the matter, the technical controls themselves, and some capabilities core to a number of the SIP requirements. Security con excuse me, secure configuration control, vulnerability management, and log intelligence. So what we're talking about here, what utilities really need is the ability to remain continuously compliant by handling changes and drift as they happen and not letting a big security policy and compliance debt build up. You may recall this graph, which shows compliance state as a function of time. This really reinforces our conceptual approach that security 
and by extension compliance, it needs to be an organizational mindset. It's, it's a way of doing business. Once you have your security controls in place and managed effectively, compliance is, is essentially a byproduct. It becomes a documentation exercise. You may recall that a few minutes ago, Sid said, if you don't know what's normal, you'll never be able to tell where there's an issue or where there's a change. This is where tools like Tripwire are incredibly valuable. We help establish a baseline for your environment, which defines what the desired state should be. This snapshot functions essentially as a line in the sand, which can be used to identify when an incident has occurred and can be instrumental to the recovery process. This matrix is a very high-level representation of the v 5 standard, and the colored boxes indicate where Tripwire can help. Now, there's a lot of ground covered by the standard. It's an incredibly diverse set of controls encompassed inside. And honestly, no vendor could hope to satisfy each and every control. Even in what we are calling out here, there's this tremendous amount of depth and nuance and many sub-requirements and sub-sub-requirements encapsulated here. So it's certainly not our claim that we can address each and every subcomponent here, but these, uh, these standards that we've indicated here are the ones where we feel we're able to offer some meaningful value either as a primary or a supporting control towards an entity's compliance initiatives. That said, a couple things to note here. SIP 7, which is historically one of the most difficult requirements to comply with, and SIP 10, which is a new feature of version 5 and defines the concept of an asset baseline, which we touched on briefly earlier. These are standards where Tripwire really shines. The controls outlined here speak directly to our core competencies as a security vendor and where we can help in a very significant way. So how exactly do we accomplish this? With uh, Tripwire's NERC Solution Suite. This is a high-level overview of our Solution Suite architecture. It's comprised of our three core applications, Tripwire Enterprise, IP360, and Tripwire Log Center, along with Taylor content and some industry-specific extensions developed explicitly to solve some of the challenges imposed by NERC SIP. So we're not going to do a deep dive on anything here, but I do want to reinforce that our approach is not a single tool, you know, everything is a nail concept. We chose these three applications because each one offers unique capabilities and controls which are instrumental to a successful SIP compliance program. Now let's take a look at one control in particular, and this is SIP 7R1 Ports and Services. So, on the surface, this requirement seems pretty straightforward. Identify what services are necessary on a given asset and the network ports involved, document what you need, and shut down anything you don't. You know, simple, right? How hard can it be? Uh, yeah, so as it turns out, in the real world, this can be really hard to do. Given the diversity of assets and how spread out they can be, this is no small challenge. So what do you do? Most organizations stick with what they know, manual processes. This usually involves sending a guy around with a list of assets and credentials that honestly may or may not work, log into each device, run netstat, copy and paste the results, dump it into a spreadsheet, and then you move on to the next one, and the next one, rinse and repeat. Then you have to do the research and investigate every port you find. Is this one really needed? Should that one be shut down? And so forth. As you might imagine, this is hugely time consuming. It's error prone, but it'll work, you know, about once. It might get you through an audit, but there's no way this is a repeatable process or a way to get any meaningful long-term security benefit. So our approach, Tripwire's approach, is a bit different. We've developed what we call the whitelist profiler. So the way this works is you codify in a single CSV file, in one artifact, all of the ports that are necessary in your environment and the processes that support that particular network interaction. And you have the place to identify description, documentation links, and so on, to the justification for why that service is important. Another key part of this is there is a place to describe and define the asset classes for which this particular service is important. That all gets built into one file, which then gets loaded onto the Tripwire console. Then what happens, we're going to walk through a little scenario here. So here you have the Tripwire server, with ha which has the whitelist 
made available. Then each monitored asset at runtime pulls down a copy of this whitelist, parses through it, and finds only the sections of the whitelist that pertain to that particular asset, and then it compares that against the actuals, what's running on that host at that point in time. And then it does an analysis to compare what it sees against what should be there. The results of this analysis are then handed back up to the console where they can be made available in dashboards, both from a red-blue compliance state, as well as being made available to your operations staff from a, from a security response standpoint. In addition, this data can also be made available for detailed analytical reporting, an example of which we can see here. So one really nice thing about this report is that it clearly identifies and describes the known good ports along with the description justification and so on, as well as the ports that are unauthorized, the ones that are unapproved. This is all self-contained in the same artifact. So as you might imagine, this here is probably a little more detailed than you would want your engineer to be receiving. You know, this is not the kind of thing that they would get any value of having dropped in their inbox every morning across, everything, you know, across all the assets that they own. But that's not necessarily the audience for this particular object here. We have other reports that are much more tailored for their needs. However, for your internal compliance staff and for your auditors, the level of detail and information that we have presented here is incredibly useful. So kind of going back to a higher level, uh, so we've just kind of seen Tripwire's approach to a single discrete control. There are literally dozens more available with our solution suite. So overall, there are four core benefits that we focus on. One of them, uh, the first is discovery and identification of your assets. We have um, a tool, Tripura IP360, which you can use to scan everything inside your ESP and identify any new assets that pop on and profile those assets based on a number of criteria, which can then help with the classification process into high, medium, and lows, uh, the impact rating criteria. We also give you the ability to have continuous monitoring across everything in your environment. So this isn't a once a month, once a quarter, mega scan. This is an ongoing operational workflow. This happens automatically. Also, everything that we are monitoring, we can automatically assess and analyze the state of those assets against your defined standards. So we're not just, we have the ability to go beyond simply telling you, hey, this changed. We can say, is this a good change? Is that appropriate? Is that inappropriate? Which can be tremendously useful from a recovery standpoint as well. And we have audit-ready evidence. So in addition to having data that's useful for your operation staff, we can also generate natively in our tool a tremendous amount of detailed document-ready evidence, which is exactly the type of thing that your, um, that your compliance staff would be getting some long-term value out of. All right, and with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Sid to uh, wrap us up. Sid? Thanks, Jason. So what are some tips as, as we kind of implement, whether it's tools like Assurex or Tripwire or this holistic program, to kind of keep in, in the back of our mind? I think one important thing to remember is that this is, you know, whether it's any of this stuff, it's not a silver bullet to solve compliance. You know, there are some shops out there that will tell you they're a one-stop shop for complying with SIP. I, I, I would view that with, with skepticism. What putting together a, a holistic program is and leveraging tools in Tripwire and AssureX does for you is it really gives you a strong bedrock foundation from which to draw and really adjust to these changing conditions better. But controls can break down. You can be out of compliance. This is just to try to minimize the risk of that happening. You don't, you don't also have to start from scratch. Uh, likely have controls frameworks and controls documented uh, throughout the organization. Um, you know, in our experience, 
most everybody has some level of controls documented for SIP compliance. They just may have not fully accessed and identified everything that they need to be fully implemented. Okay. So you can gap against something like a recognized framework, like COSO or NIST or ISO 27K. To kind of give you a full flavor of how you address cyber risk overall throughout the organization. And it's really important as you evaluate your controls and take a look at your operations of the, your environment to institutionalize and make part of the fabric of your organization a corrective action process. I think uh, Trey has some additional color that he can add uh, there based on nuclear experience. That's right, Sid. Um, I started in the nuclear industry and as everyone knows, it's got a strong corrective action program, and it is mandatory. When I moved over in 2006 to on the transmission side, I noticed that maintenance and safety issues were identified. But it's taken a while for the uh, registered entities to understand the importance of identifying all the issues related to compliance, documenting them, and mitigating them based on their risk in the organization. So another important piece of that is also sharing lessons learned internally to help build a strong reliability culture. That's it. Thanks, thanks Trey. And, and so kind of as you institutionalize that program, one key component of doing that is going to be knowing who's responsible. Documenting that somewhere and identifying, making sure that they know that they're responsible for complying with uh, a particular control or leading a particular control effort. So identify those accountable parties and identify the paths through which they communicate when something happens or between themselves or when they have identified areas for improvement. Who do they call? And finally, you want to regularly take a look at, at your program and the operation of those controls. You want to prevent those controls from just sitting on a shelf and collecting dust. We want to know kind of what that state is. And I know that Jason has some specific thoughts on, on how you can get there. Yeah, thanks, Sid. So honestly, I would say the three most important things that will help any organization prevent kind of the, the die-off of a functional security and compliance program, honestly, the top three things, automate, automate, automate. You need to get away from manual processes whenever possible. Manual processes are simple, they're compelling, they, they sound good and easy to do, but they are not sustainable. And for something like this, with what's at stake with the delivery of reliable power, you've got to make sure that as much mechanical automation is imbued in your process as possible. Well, thanks, Jason. So here's some pitfalls to avoid, some things to, to consider. Right? Don't try to eliminate all the risk. Don't try to get to zero. It's impossible. Right? You can spend a lot of money and you'll never get there. The objective overall for any of these compliance efforts is to lower risk. And by putting in the holistic strategy, whether in tools or otherwise, create that compelling story to talk about how you've lowered risk is really important. But if, you're, if your overall objective is to get rid of it all entirely, uh, I think you'll find yourself spinning your wheels there towards the end. You don't need to add controls for the sake of adding controls. Uh, a 600 control environment or a 6,000 control environment is not necessarily any better from an environment that has less controls that are just really tailored to the organization. So make sure that you, as you go through the risk rationalization process, identify the areas of greatest risk to the organization. And again, that gets into telling your compelling story. We went through this process, we identified our highest areas of risk, and here are the controls that we use to address them. And finally, don't identify controls without control owners. You kind of echoed in the tips to do before, but you know, if there's not somebody that's responsible for the maintenance and operation of those controls, it's, there's a high likelihood um, of them atrophy, even in a case where you automate, automate, automate. So some key questions to ask. We're just going to go through some of these really quickly. I know that we're, we're short on time, but what are our greatest areas of risk? Have we done uh, an evaluation of that as an organization? Does our company already have an internal controls program that we can leverage? Perhaps some of this stuff has already been created for other uh, regulatory efforts, whether it's EPA or SOX or otherwise. Are controls identified and documented anywhere, defined and documented anywhere, rather? What framework did we use for our controls? 
did we use COSO, COVID? Did we use NIST or ISO or any of the other valuable frameworks that are out there? How often do we review and test our controls? I think it's really important as part of the whole compliance effort to internally evaluate how we're doing on a fairly regular basis and not just as part of a, a lead up to a compliance uh, deadline. Identify how much is enough and how much is too much. Kind of know when to say when. Uh, like I said before and alluded to, a 6,000 control environment not necessarily better than one that has less. And has our program really considered the resiliency component? I think a lot of programs we find a deal with the compliance effort and definitely securing the cyber environment and they've, they may have even gone the next step and really rationalized their controls, but what we find is that that last step is, is really valuable for organization to really take another step back and look at what happens when it breaks. So finally, what does it look like in the end? What are kind of the three things that you would want to see? First, is you're going to want to see a program that's managed. Holistic framework that covers multiple areas of business risk, including NERC not just specific to NERC. But again, this is part of telling that compelling story. Secondly, how is it maintained? How often do we take a look at the operation of those controls? How often do we ensure that compliance is, is an ongoing process internally? Finally, what do we do to improve? That kind of gets back to what Trey talked about with the <coughs> the corrective action process. Part of it is going to be the, part of the evaluation process. Part of it might be the automation process and the outcomes thereof. But what is that process for taking that information where we know we have an opportunity for improvement and kind of circulating that back into the overall process to make sure we grow and mature our overall program? So finally, as we mentioned at the beginning, we're excited about hosting what we think is a compelling one and a half day workshop. We've got guest speakers coming in from the FBI, a uh, guy formerly with the NSA. We're going to go into much greater detail over the SIP standards. You're going to be able to challenge the presenters, ask your questions, get advice from all the experts there. And we're going to work that with you to help you solve your compliance uh, issues, save time and effort with your compliance efforts. You can get some CE credits for it and hopefully have a little bit of fun. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see some of you at the workshop in Houston. Thank you very much, Sid. And I would like to thank you, Sid, and all of our presenters, uh, Sid Schaefer from ICS, Trey Kirkpatrick from AssureX, and Jason Eiler from Tripwire. And thank you to our audience today for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and a PDF of the slides. Also, you may reply to that email if you'd like to earn a CPE credit for attending the webcast today. We hope you'll join us for future webcasts. Check out tripwire.com for future events, and also check out our blog, State of Security. Thank you, and have a great day.